Hi everybody, Andrew Cuneo here with a new YouTube video. This time it's going to be yet another update to the Tainted Pact deck. I played Tainted Pact in Historic at the recent set championships, which I did not make day two because I started 0-3 in Alchemy. But then I almost rallied to make day two with Tainted Pact. I went a combined 3-1. and one. Well, I, I went 3-1. and one. Facing Phoenix three times and facing a Jun Food deck. I went 2-1 and one against Phoenix and I beat Jun Food. So I thought it'd be useful to look at how I have evolved the deck since the last time I made a video, because there are a couple of changes I made. And then also there was another team of three players. I think they all played identical Esper Pact lists. Uh, there might have been slight discrepancies. It's really hard to compare the, the different Pact lists because there's just so many one ofs in every list. Uh, they did not do great. They went 4-8 and eight, and they went 0-5 and five in Phoenix. So I thought 0-5 oh, versus Phoenix. I thought it'd be good to look at how their deck was constructed versus how mine was constructed and uh, maybe try to figure out why they did not do as well against Phoenix as I'm sure they were hoping to do. So for starters, this is the Tainted Pact list as it appeared in my last YouTube video. And it's really, really similar to the list that I'm about to show you, which is my current build. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's just actually jump to the current build. And I'll point out the differences there. So this is the current build that I'm playing. And there's one difference that I've made since the set championship, because a new card's been printed, which is also one of the reasons I want to make this video. There's this card, Painful Bond, which if you've been playing Alchemy at all on the ladder, it, it, almost everyone's playing black and almost all, everyone's playing four copies of this card. It's incredibly good. Uh, it's maybe not quite as home, quite as at home in Historic, but I do think it's, a, it's an extremely good card in this deck because the it, it's basically two mana instant draw two cards. The, the drawback is really, really minimal. It only it's going to make things that are CMC three or greater you lose one life when you cast them. And if you look at my at this list, there's there are some CMC three or greater cards, but there's really not that many. And some of them you're not even really planning to cast for their mana value. Like you're not going to play Memory Leak for its mana value very often. You're not going to play Shark Typhoon for its mana value very often. I mean, certainly you have the option of, if you don't want to lose life, you can just cycle either of those. Then there are a handful of cards that you are, it is going to cause you to lose one life, but you're, you're not likely to have more than one of those in your hand by the time this resolves. So a lot of the times this is going to be two mana instant draw two cards. You lose one life at some point down the road, which you can actually control. You know, you could choose not to cast the card if losing a life is going to be a big deal. Uh, sometimes it's just going to be two mana draw two cards. You don't lose anything. So this card's really, really good. The card I cut from my deck is Key to the Archive, which was powerful, but kind of clunky. Historic has become a really, really low-to-the-ground format where your cards all need to be very efficient. You, you can't waste a bunch of time in Historic, especially if you want to be competitive against Phoenix. So that's the change I made since the set championship. At the set championship, this was a Key to the Archive. Uh, looking at what changes I made between my most recent video, which predates the set championship, and what I played at the set championship, there are a couple of changes I made to make the matchup better against Phoenix. The first is I cut Pact of Negation from my deck entirely. I'm playing one Soul Guide Lantern in the main deck, and that is basically just to be better against Phoenix. A huge part of beating Phoenix is controlling their graveyard because... You need to make it so their Unholy Heats cannot be cast to deal 6 damage to Jace. It's really, really hard to win through them having Unholy Heats that can deal 6 damage to Jace. So you need to be able to fight the Delirium from their graveyard, which is where the Soul Guide Lantern comes in. Honestly, Soul Guide Lantern is a card that's so good in the matchup, you should be considering tutoring it for it with a Wishclaw Talisman, you should be considering sometimes casting risky Tainted Packs just to find the Soul Guide Lantern in the matchup. That's going to depend heavily on how the game is going, but that is a play that you need to have in your repertoire to do well in that matchup. One other change that was made is there used to be a Cold Steel Heart in the deck. I replaced it with an Ice Tunnel. Sadly, it's the return of 
uh, comes into play tapped land that doesn't give you any special benefit. Uh, but I found that Cold Steel Heart was just too clunky to cast against Phoenix. It, it was just too mana efficient or too mana inefficient to cast. And especially in the sideboarded games, you really want to play at instant speed a lot of the time. So having a two mana artifact that's going to come into play tapped was just really not very appealing. I have had some people ask me since I put Ice Tunnel back in my deck why I'm not playing with like Dismal Backwater that gains you a life as opposed to being a snow land. The reason is this counts as an island in a swamp, which helps a couple of the other lands come into play untapped, like a, a drowned catacomb. Then uh, two other changes to the sideboard. One is the Soul Guide Lantern used to be in the sideboard, so putting it in the main deck opened up another sideboard slot, which could have been the Pact of Negation, but I really found the Pact of Negation wasn't good in any of the matchups I cared about. It was just not a card I was ever happy to draw to draw. And also on Arena Pact of Negation is incredibly annoying to have in your hand because if your opponent's playing attention at all, it kind of gives away that it's in your hand. So you, you have to either decide to just play in full control mode all the time or just accept that you're going to be telegraphing when you have Pact of Negation a lot of the time. And I didn't want to do either of those things at the set championship, so I was happy to get it out of the deck. And like I said, it's not a card that there, there's no matchup where you really, really want to have it. So I'm happy not to have it. The card I replaced it with is a Meat Hook Massacre. And the reason for this was, I, I think this is just a, a generally good card, especially against you know, like white weenie decks. But it's also a card you can be pretty happy to board in against a Cat Oven deck because it is going to slow down the rate at which they drain you out by quite a lot. I think the Cat Oven matchup is generally pretty good, but I think this is just another tool you have to make the matchup even better. Also, Meat Hook Massacre is just an incredibly good card. I, I think it it's already proven that it really belongs in Historic in the Green-Black Cat Oven decks. And I, I think there's just, you know, if you're a black deck and you want a sweeper in Historic, you should be considering Meat Hook Massacre because it really is that good. Uh, the other change I made is a really minor one. I replaced the Relic of Progenitus with the Lantern of the Lost because I think that against Phoenix, Relic was not as good as Lantern of the Lost. You, you don't really want to be exiling your own graveyard in the Phoenix matchup because I do board in Leer in that matchup. Uh, so exiling your own graveyard is, is really not what you want to do. And the Lantern, also the fact that it can hit a card the turn it comes into play, it hits the card you want to hit as opposed to Relic, which is just going to be removing a card of their choice every turn. I think that's slightly better. So I, th I think that's a real minor upgrade, but I do think it is an upgrade. I think if you wanted to make the Phoenix matchup even better, you should be looking to add a card like Tormod's Crypt to the sideboard. It, the sideboard, it, it's pretty tight, though, so I would say that, that I don't know that there's room for that. Uh, so that's my current list. Let's go and look now at the Esper Pact list to see how their deck is constructed, see if there's anything that I'd want to move into my deck going forward, or if there, there's basically anything we can learn from this list. So right away, something that's gonna jump out to you about this list is that there is a like a reanimation sub-theme. They've got a, three expensive creatures, and the ways to reanimate them that I see in the deck are one copy of Imburial Rites. Obviously, you can't play duplicates of anything. To, this, to do this reanimation package if you want the Pact combo to work. And one Priest of Fell Rites. So they've got two good reanimation cards. And they've got three things to reanimate. What do they have to facilitate uh, getting these cards into the graveyard? They've got one Champion of Wits. They've got a Search for Azkanta. They've got Consider... They've got uh, one copy of Faithful Mending. The Celestis can do it in a pinch. Uh, Key of the Archive also does it, I guess, if you draw the card. So there's there's a, there's a few enablers and a few reanimation cards and a few reanimation targets. So it's like a really minor theme, which to me, when you when you want to play this packed deck one of the things you're really going to fight against is just the general inconsistency of the singleton nature of your deck. 
and this re this minor reanimation sub theme, I, I, I it's like you're you're just making your deck even more consistent. So I'm not really a big fan of this. Uh, one of the other things which we're going to get to in a second that you have to fight against in the Tainted Pact list is just the consistency of your mana because you don't have the luxury of playing four of the good dual lands. You have to play singletons of all the dual lands that you choose to play. So it just the quality of the mana in Tainted Pact has gotten a lot better since Strixhaven first came out, but it is still... The biggest downside of the deck is just it, you're going to have lands that come into play tapped. You're just you're trying to achieve a combo that's trying to cast a triple blue card, and you're also playing black cards. And this deck has some double white cards it's actually trying to cast. I don't. I, they they even have double black cards in the sideboard. So like this deck is really the mana is, requirements are incredibly extreme, uh, and I think that that is a pretty big problem with the way this deck is built. Uh, but looking at it, let, let's look at like what are the other white cards that they're playing beyond this reanimation package, which I, I don't think the reanimation package was a good idea. I think probably their reason for doing it was that they wanted a way to just kind of KO the Phoenix decks. Like they wanted nut draws that, that Phoenix just couldn't beat in game one. And so if you get an Elish Norn into play on say turn four against Phoenix, they're not going to win. Same thing with Sarah's Emissary, and probably the same thing with Dream Trawler, too. So, like, they do... This does give you the potential for nut draws that beat Phoenix, but I think it just makes your deck too inconsistent. So I'm not wild about that. Uh, white cards that I do think look pretty good, and if I was going to add white to my build of Tainted Pact, definitely Teferi Hero of Dominaria looks pretty good. Faithful Mending also looks pretty good. It's not card advantage but it is card selection and it does dig you pretty deep so that that's that's another one that looks kind of appealing and gaining two life it's not nothing march of otherworldly light i think has proven to be a really effective removal spell in historic so that's another one that's kind of appealing i don't know if i'd be willing to play double white cards farewell looks kind of appealing to me too kaya is kind of interesting as a graveyard hate card that's also you know it's it's Reasonable against Phoenix, reasonable against Cat Oven. That's This is another one that looks kind of appealing. Divine Purge, I don't even think you should be playing this in cards or in decks that are good at getting double white, so I certainly wouldn't be interested in chewing horning it into this deck. Also, they're just permanent. Like, they have a Cold Steel Heart they're going to be exiling and Soul Guide Lantern. So it's not like this is... And they have the Celestis. So it's not like this is completely uh, one-sided even. Not wild about this one in this deck at all. Uh, then they've got a lot. They, they have like similar removal package. They have a Davriel's Withering in their main deck, which that is a good card against Phoenix. So that makes a certain amount of sense. I could maybe see having that in main deck in my deck. They have an Eliminate. I'm not wild about that. They have a Doomblade in their main deck, which I have an Infernal Grasp in my sideboard. And the reason I have the Infernal Grasp in my, in my sideboard is mostly because I wanted to be able to kill Corvald. Corvald's not a very played card at this point, so maybe my Infernal Grasp should just be a Doomblade. Uh, outside of that, not a huge amount of difference in the spells. Uh, one thing they do, they have a Memory Deluge where I'm playing a Behold the Multiverse. And I liked Behold the Multiverse better just because of the clunky nature of the mana base. I think a lot of the time you have, you're going to have to be having comes into play tap lands as part of the, the sequencing of your game plan. So just being able to cast the Behold where you're going to spread the cost across two turns frequently fits better in the sequencing of your lands than Memory Deluge. Uh, the one, I mean, obviously the... The upside of Memory Deluge is the seven mana ability, and I just don't think there's enough games that go long that you're really getting much upside from there. And I, I do think that even though like double blue versus single blue is not a big deal for this deck, it's the the ability to spread the cast and cost of Behold across two turns is going to allow you to play tap lands in spots where it doesn't hurt you more often. They have an Extinction event as one of their main deck sweepers. I've never liked this card very much in historic i like I, I don't think it's a particularly good card against phoenix just because 
it, like a, the Phoenix deck does have odd and even cast and cost creatures, and exile like sometimes exiling the, the actual Phoenixes is going to be good, but sometimes that's not going to be good enough. So I'm not, I'm not wild about that one. Uh, yeah. So then we come to kind of the biggest issue I have with this deck, and that is the mana base. If you look at the mana base, you could. I guess argue that they actually have enough colored sources for what their deck is trying to do, which is triple blue, double white, and occasionally double black. And even though they, they, they're doing double white and occasional double black, if you look, so many of their cheap cards are black that you do need to have a lot of early black mana. So it's even though there's not technically any cards in the main deck that cost double black, you want a mana base that's going to function where you're getting black early enough that it's like you're a double black deck just because you have so many black one mana cards. And the so maybe they've met kind of a, the requirements for how many sources in each color you're going to need. But if you look at what had to happen in, in order to meet that, the answer is there's a lot of lands that are going to come into play tapped. So I did a count, and I'm not going to claim this is 100% accurate because it's... It's just hard to look at this and be 100% accurate. But in my mana base, I had five lands that are always going to come into play tapped, and I have six lands that are going to condi conditionally come into play tapped. By conditionally come into play tapped, I mean it's... Yeah, I'm, I'm counting something like Forsaken Crossroads. You might be on the play, you might be on the draw. That one's going to conditionally come into play tapped. Uh, another la other lands like Call of Storm Giants might come into play tapped, depending on when you have to play it. Deserted Beach might come into play tapped. That's what I mean by conditionally, and then always come into play tapped is going to be something like a Triome or Fetid Pools. So my, my list had five that always come into play tapped, six that come into play conditionally tapped. This mana base, by my count, has eight that always come into play tapped. Only four that conditionally come into play untapped, and that's because they don't have uh, Drowned Catacomb or Glacial Fortress. That, that's one of the differences. They also don't have a Castle Vantress in their list. Those are the ones that I have that they don't have, which is why I have more that conditionally come into play tapped, even though in my mana base, a lot of the time, Castle Vantress and Drown Catacomb come into play untapped when you want to play them. So this is like one of the huge drawbacks of trying to play Esper is you just have to play a lot more tapped lands. And that was not a cost I was willing to play. Uh, then we, get, we look at the sideboard cards. Um... They have some of the same stuff I've got. Some of the stuff I've got in my main deck they have in the sideboard. Like, I have Mystical Dispute and Spell Pierce in my main deck. I think those are actually pretty awesome main deck cards. They don't. They have them in their sideboard. They've got a lot more Graveyard Hate in the form of Graveyard Trespasser, which that seems pretty underwhelming for this format. Go Blank, which maybe I should just have in my deck. That, that actually seems like a, a pretty good sideboard card. Uh... Then they've got a ley line, which, like, obviously I could be playing ley line in my pack list. I think it's just a worse card than, like, the Relic of Progenitus, Tormod's Crypt type cards. Because the games against Phoenix, especially the sideboard games, go pretty long. You do, you're, This is awesome if it's in your opening hand. It's going to be pretty bad if you draw it later on. And so I, I think that you, you the games go long enough and you have enough cards in your deck that... A sec eventually, essentially replace themselves. So you're going to get to see a big chunk of your deck. The ratio of cards that you're going to draw versus cards that are in your opening hand is pretty heavily slanted towards cards you're going to draw. And what I mean by that is, like, if you think about a card like Consider, it's going to show up in your opening hand. It's going to turn into one of your sideboard cards a decent percentage of the time. And if you're turning it into a Leyline of the Void as the game progresses, that's not very good. If you're turning it into a card like Relic of Progenitus, Tormod's Crypt, one of the Lanterns, that is actually good. And there's a fair number of cards that function like that in this list. So um, that, I think that that is a weaker form of sideboard card uh, than uh, just another Tormod's Crypt. They've got their Shark Typhoon in the sideboard. That's not something I like very much about this list either. Because I think you want, I, 
even though you want to play the matchups so where you're trying to do the tainted pact combo as your your that's your a plan in in all games you do want to have a good b plan and shark typhoon's actually a pretty good b plan i beat the the phoenix decks a lot of the time by hard casting this uh, in game one in sideboard games too like that is one of my main ways that i'm beating phoenix is by hard casting shark typhoon and then your deck is almost entirely non-creature cards so you just trigger it a lot and it, it, the phoenix deck if they're not ahead they can't beat a hard cast shark typhoon once you get to untap usually like they they need to kill you in one or two turn window or the shark typhoon is just going to win the game um more sweepers it's like double white and double black right? it, it's hard to get over Saloon of Sea and Sky, that's a card I considered playing with, but I've got Eternal Kefnet because I thought it was better against Phoenix. I, I have to say that the God Eternal Kefnet has not performed as well as I was hoping. That's a card I'm kind of looking to upgrade. I don't know that this Faloon is the card that I would choose to upgrade it with. One other thing I wanted to say about their list is that they don't have that many ways to draw cards at instant speed, which I think is a big part of being able to execute the Jace combo through removal or hate cards. What I mean by that is that a lot of the times when you when you have Jace in play and you Tainted Pact, your opponents are going to go for just kind of a, an emergency, hope that you don't have anything and I can kill you. They're going to let you Tainted Pact your whole deck away, and then when you try to win with the Jace, they're going to kill it with Unholy Heat, or if they have a card like Devil or Murderous Rider, just whatever whatever they have that can interact with Planeswalkers, Fateful Absence, they're going to do that in response to you trying to win. And one way you can fight through that is by having cards that allow you to draw at instant speed. And this list has a few. It has Consider, Opt, Soul Guide Lantern, Faithful Mending. Uh, I guess you could do it with the Celestis as well. But if you look at my list, it, like one of the reasons I have a memory leak in my list, which is a pretty weird looking card, is that you can, for one mana, draw at instant speed, and that will allow you to fight through some hate some of the times with Jace. Also, I, I think my list is just, it, it, it has a lot more cards that are just going to let you rip through your deck more quickly to, to set up whatever your plan is going to be, which is generally going to be Jace. So... That, that's another thing I'm not wild about, about this list. And honestly, that's another difference between Memory Deluge and Behold the Multiverse. Behold the Multiverse can be used to generate draws at instant speed. Memory Deluge does not even generate draws, and it, it also always costs four. It's never going to cost two. The, the one thing I would take away from looking at this list, honestly, is that I think I would like to have Teferi Hero of Dominaria in my list, and I'd like to test Faithful Mending. That might be a good one, and Kaya might be a good one. And with Streets of New Caperna coming out, they're going to print the Esper version of the Triome. It's not going to be called a Triome, but it's going to be functionally an Esper Triome. And I think at that point, between the Triome and lands like Shattered Sanctum, Deserted Beach... I think the mana is going to be good enough that I will start being comfortable playing three colors. So I think I'm going to look to fit Teferi in my deck at a minimum. Because Teferi is just a way... Teferi can win the game literally just on its own if, it, if it's unopposed. You don't even need to do anything else. Teferi is just a win condition on its own. And just having more cards that can win through whatever hate they have you know so you're not always forced to try to go for the jace tainted pact combo i think it's great i i do not think i will be trying this reanimation package it, it does not seem good to me so with that i guess let's i'm gonna run through one match with tainted pact this matchup could get a little bit tricky Hmm. Guess I'm not gonna play the sandbar this turn because I, I think I'm gonna want to play the sandbars on land. 
probably, but if I play the sandbar as a land and I want to play the talisman on turn two, it requires setting the pathway on black, which means I won't be able to play Archmage's Charm on turn three, which I want to be able to do. Looks like it's maybe some sort of Jeskai control deck. Let's see if they have a main deck mystical dispute. If you wish to surrender now, I have just the trick for you. I don't even have a way to, to make it so that I could get double black into play at this point. To set up the, to just do the ten impact combo if they somehow tapped out. So I think we're going to be playing slowly for a little bit. Maybe they're going to Prismari command my Narset and Wishclaw Talisman. If that's what happens, I'm just going to let it resolve. Yeah. That's fine. Still have much to learn. I, don't, I didn't need to use the Talisman to set up a win. It's always a little bit dangerous against control decks using the Talisman because they're going to be able to go and get a counter, which is going to be annoying for you. Hey, it's the new card, Painful Bond. You're going to make me lose one life from my Behold the Multiverse. Oh, and one life from the Archmage's Charm. And another life from the Mystical Dispute. This may be the largest amount of life I've ever seen someone lose from pain, Painful Bond. But it's also in a matchup where it's not going to matter at all. Now that I've decided not to kind of really go hard for the combo... I'm, I'm going to have to fight through whatever it is they've got going on. Which means that I'm going to need to find some discard cards probably. Or I could find... Uh, a card like Shark Typhoon, which would force my opponent to do something. Yeah, I have to discard a card, which I'm not wild about having to do that, but we'll go ahead and discard this Triome. I think I'm going to cycle the Shark Typhoon to see if I can get my opponent to the spot where they're going to need to start acting first. I guess I'll counter that instead. I'll probably just take a Jace off of this. Unless something else catches my eye before I see the first Jace, but I think Jace would be the best card. It's a little awkward. I do want to just start casting these Jaces, but I'm going to cycle the Shark Typhoon before I get to that point. Two damage from the Painful Bond. It's really starting to add up. So is this card a saw it coming? What else could it be? I think it's probably a saw it coming. 
a little awkward in this matchup in particular to cycle and make your Shark Typhoon only a 3-3 instead of making it a 4-4 because they're very likely to have Lightning Helix in their deck. Let's see what their deck actually is. take a card from my graveyard instead because I don't want to power down my Drown in the Lock. At this point the Drown in the Lock is capable of countering a Teferi. I know that's not actually true, it's not. But I would like it to be able to counter a Teferi, so. I didn't want to exile a card from their graveyard. Alright, so they've got Three unknown cards. I'm pretty sure this is a sod coming. Portable hole, that's fine. I don't think there's any reason I need to have a Soul Guide Lantern in play against what my opponent's deck appears to be. reason I would want to be worried about milling them. They could hit Memory Deluge, so I'm going to mill myself. Uh, with seven cards in their yard, I, I think that Drown on the Lock is going to be good enough to do what I want it to do. Oh, if they're playing this deck. Interesting. This is like a Jeskai Turns deck. I'm going to sideboard the same way I generally sideboard against Control, which is I board in Thought Distortion, Leer, Brazen Borrower, Miscast, and Reckoner Bankbuster. And then I'm going to take out the Sweepers. They obviously don't do anything. I usually take Wishclaw Talisman out against people who are going to have Dovin's Veto in their deck. And it's also not a good card against Prismari Command, as we saw that game, because it's... It, this card, you want to be able to cast it when you have the mana and let it sit and play until you're ready to use it, and you just can't do that against somebody with Prismari Command. And then I think I'm going to take out Fatal Push. They do probably have Sharks, Shark Typhoons, but I'm still going to have Drown in the Lock and uh, Archmage's Charm, Baleful Mastery, Bloodsheath Thirst. So I'm still going to have some answers to a shark. I'm going to have my own shark. Fatal Push is just a card that's too narrow, I think. I also boarded out Otherworldly Gaze there. That is a card that I board out an awful lot. This is not a good matchup to keep a one-lander. And the reason I boarded out that Otherworldly Gaze is that... I, I board that out a lot because generally when you sideboard in Magic, you should be making your deck more efficient at interacting with your opponent's deck, and you should be assuming that they're doing the same thing. And a card like Otherworldly Gaze, where you're going to be investing a card basically only in selection, it's just inherently card disadvantage. Its advantage is it allows you to kill more consistently and more quickly, but this is not a matchup where you just want to goldfish as, po as fast as possible. That is an annoying card that they got to resolve. Hopefully my bank buster is good enough to fight through it. It does make Painful Bond far less appealing because now I'm only going to get to draw one card. And unless I can get the Narset off the board, which maybe I'll eventually be able to do that. Oh, 
Oh, that was my only black mana. I guess that's fine. So I would like to find a, some way to make sure that they don't resolve at the fairy next turn. Also, I do need to find some sort of card that's going to get this Narset off the board eventually. Narset is a pretty annoying card for them to have in play. Hmm. I want a second Tainted Pact. Probably not. Second Tainted Pact does allow me to kind of get a Jace and then exile my deck. But the problem with that is that... It wouldn't even win with a Narset in play. And it's also just, I'm not really in a spot to try to win the game like that. What I can do here, what I'm probably, all right, they conceded because they didn't have lands, which was sad. That was going to be an interesting game, I thought. I, I was probably going to try to just Tainted Pact and see if I could hit a Thought Distortion before I hit a Jace. If I had hit a Jace, I would have, probably stuck with the jace but it, that would have been a really good spot to go and get a thought distortion and there's a 50 50 shot i hit a thought distortion before i hit a jace that's gonna do it for this video today hope you guys liked going back over 10 impact again it does seem like people enjoy looking at the deck if you are one of those people and you haven't subbed yet please go ahead and do it and i'll see you next time